All right. All right. This is the NeoBooks call for Monday, April 8th, 2024. Uh, Eclipse Day, if you're in the uh, United States. In fact, at 11.25 my time, so in an hour, a little under an hour, is when the eclipse will pass nearest to Oregon. Uh, we'll we'll only get like 15 or 20 percent uh, occlusion, so we get nothing. We'll it'll look like a a cloud passed overhead, but but that's when it gets closest to us. So um, we get 91 percent. Really? Um, it's right over me. Yeah. Oh man. Oh okay. At what time? Three you something. haven't figured out I what have time. Because I really don't care. I'm sorry. I really care. don't care. <laughs> I mean, I, I do have skylights and I did open the shades, so I'll be in the vicinity if there's a dark. I am interested to see what the environment will look like, yeah. not necessarily the sun. So you don't need to you don't need to look at the sun. A really cool thing is any little pinhole outdoors will act as a pinhole camera. And on the ground, you'll see a projection of what the sun looks like at that moment. So. If you go out, if you start noticing it getting a little darker and go outside and look under trees, for example, um, you'll see little patterns of, of semicircles, which are the the basically the, the the shrinking sun as the moon comes in front of it. And then at full at totality, you should I don't know what you'll see, but basically you never look at directly at it without protection or glasses. But if you look on the ground, you're perfectly safe. Um, and as I said. Uh, any little pinhole acts as a pinhole camera. So you could take a, a, a take an index card, punch a little hole in it with a needle, take that outside and, and look through that. Don't look through that at the sun, look through right, that, no, I know. Let, let it shine on the ground. I mean, I didn't we all learn that in kindergarten not to look at the sun? I mean, yeah. real. <laughs> yeah. I've heard it said that if you take a colander, you could see like, you know, 100 images uh, it's very likely true. I, what what happened um, to me was one day when I was in Manhattan, there was a partial eclipse that I'd forgotten about entirely. And I went out to get lunch at noon. And as I step outside, I'm like, what is up here? Because it seems really weirdly dark. And then everybody is collected around the trees. And they're all around the trees looking down because all the little holes between the leaves are making pinhole semicircles on the ground. And it's beautiful. So I bet you a colander of the right size holes does exactly that. Yeah. Not a pasta colander, but something finer mashed. I don't know. Who knows? How is everybody? We're good. I'm I'm um nice. Dude. The, 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 <laughs> that's right. The dude abides. <laughs> um I'm, uh, I was just uh, saying, uh, as everybody started showing up, that I'm working on a presentation to explain what neobooks are. It's not the easiest going because I've got a couple other presentations that have priority, and I'm, I'm pretty far further along on those. However, I'm having a good time imagining how to explain these things to anybody. And I hope uh, maybe by next week's call to have a, a demo. And then I hope to take over one of the OGM calls to do the, OV, to do the uh, neobooks update that we were talking about recently. Um, so that's on my agenda. And I'm also trying to make the NeoBooks presentation an, a, a bit of an example of a NeoBook, but not entirely. Um, but uh, it'll it'll hopefully make sense once I've got it kind of going. Then all advice, suggestions. In, in fact, it might be interesting to ask each of you uh, for a one minute try at explaining what you think a neobook is and i can incorporate those as they work i think you can incorporate also some of the um vision from the agreement mm -hmm. in the spreadsheet yeah mm -hmm. yeah because folks, folks articulated what their vision of a neobook was so I think there's enough meat in there. Good idea. I will go back to the previous ones. So I don't, if anybody wants to take a swing at that, that'd be great. Well, I, I, I just, I will share that I've been kind of 
doing my best to polish what I think is the um, my neo book, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, I think it will may serve as a very very good example of a neo book because there's lots of space there for um, experts in various aspects of um, what I have articulated as places that we need to fix, renew, if we're to have a, um, a, a viable society going forward. And I don't profess to be an expert in all of these areas. So there's lots of opportunity, I think, for that book to be very alive. Um, and, you know, and I, am I being lazy here? <laughs> is the question I asked myself, or is there, you know, or do I want to have room for other people's input? And I want to have room for other folks' input. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a piece of the magic of what neo books ought to be doing if they yeah. work properly. Mm -hmm. Is they, they're they're the result of conversation, debate, experiment, etc. Right, and and hopefully they get better over time as a result of those things. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. Klaus, do you want to take a swing at it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, just just from from my perspective, the 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 topics I'm working on uh, is is systems focused. You know? and when you uh, talk about a system as complex, a wicked system, really like food. Uh, you get into an endless list of specialties and expertise uh, required, you know, to uh, to deal with to 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 understand these interconnecting parts. So all I can really do is provide a nugget that talks about uh, um, water tables, talks about soil health, talks about uh, nutrient quality, and so on. But then each one of these. Uh, uh, needs a deep dive to explore that topic much, much more. But there is also a need to stay at the meta level, you know, and, and, and understand how these parts interlink. So my attempt with the Neo book is, particularly with the volume two, is to simply point out all these moving parts that are connected some, that are deeply connected, but each have life of their own, you, you know? So, and you need to understand enough about each one of these uh, individual nuggets to fit them into the bigger picture. Right. You know? um, so the statements um, that I'm making, and I do it with, with AI technology assistance, um, need to be accurate, right? Without going into any level of specificity, but at the top line, they need to be accurate because then you can use them. Then you know that you know the, the water holding capacity of soil, you know, is contributing to the hydrologic cycles. So when you make a statement like this, the science behind this is enormous. You know, and you and you don't want to get into this because then you're confusing people and 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 you're losing you're losing the point you're trying to make. But it needs to be accurate at the same time. Yeah. So there's a there's an interesting question in writing in general about when do you put in a link into what, right? Because uh, linky text, the links can offer deeper explanations for any of the particular phenomena and at different levels of abstraction. So you might talk about the, the small water cycle and you might explain it at a very meta level, but then you could add a couple links to say, hey, to go deeper, I recommend these three videos. And those right. three videos might themselves have embedded links and research and point to actual research reports and whatever else. And that's great. And I think part of the question is, to what level of abstraction does a neo book want to be written? And in fact, it might be written at, at two, two levels of abstraction. You might have the summary neo book that stays always at the meta level with a couple links, but then you might include some of the prose from the explanations in the body of the text for people who are smart but aren't aware of the issues and don't know what the we you know what the explanation is, and that might be the same exact thesis except a more a, a more expanded book because it contains more explanations. And I don't and I don't think those two things would be 
contradictory. They would just be you know, like whoever wants to get the neo book or read it would read it at the level that they understand or need for understanding. And I, I think we're in this era of linky texts and hypertext. We're still figuring out where are those boundaries and what are the, what is the right shape for the artifacts. But but that that's really critically important. So I, as an example, you know, I always give you like an example that gets into too much of the weeds. But I have this running conversation with Foley from the Project Hada. So he makes this bold statement that we're going alpha alpha in the desert. Uh, and you, so you shouldn't eat hamburgers. So, so he's linking going alpha alpha in the desert with uh, uh, eating hamburgers. So you should stop eating hamburgers. Well, that has nothing to do with it. They're going alpha alpha in the desert to ship it to Saudi Arabia and to Japan and to China to feed dairy cows, right? And even here in the US, it's dairy that is being fed with alpha alpha. So here's, Fo here's Foley, Jonathan Foley, making these bold meta-level statements, and it's all wrong. You know, and, and so and so he's confusing people, and he's such an important guy, and he's doing such good work in so many levels. But when you when you make sloppy mistakes like this, you know, then you're then you are at opening yourself up to uh, being ridiculed and getting attacked and you know and being basically uh, sidelined. So 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 this this neo book concept is really important to have the meta level data correct. You know? mm -hmm. um, and Foley has a TED talk um, from 2023 called "The Climate Solutions Worth Funding Now." And I don't know whether you would agree with most of it or disagree with parts of it or what. I don't know. Have you seen that one? I okay. have, but the the the, okay. the postings that he is doing are sloppy, huh. uh, simply factually sloppy. Gotcha. Um, good. And so, uh, how does the neo book help, or what are the questions you want the neo book to answer to to cut through that? What I, I mean, everybody writes, you know, in, in different contexts, but the neo book um, needs to be needs to be factually accurate or generic enough, you know, to not get into levels of specificity where, uh, you know, you 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 need so much more information to to uh, to really get this correct. You can absolutely say we should eat less hamburgers. That's perfectly fine, but then. Uh, then you need to also understand that the majority of the problem comes from CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, and 40% of corn being fed to being used as animal feed, right? So, so there, there, is, um, there is so much more knowledge required to, to, uh, to get into, into such levels of specificity. So I think uh, 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 our, the meta books, nuggets need to be uh, very, um, very well thought through in in the context of of making your statements generic enough, so that they can become they can become useful and accurate on a meta level. If that makes sense, I th I think so. Uh, Dave, welcome to the call. I'm I'm trying to do a presentation explaining what neo books are. So I'm asking. I'm sort of we're doing a little round robin to see what everybody thinks a neo book is, so I can bake some of that in. And the question Klaus and I were just talking about was, what level of detail, what level of meta or generality should we be writing at? And what level of specificity and detail do we need to go to, depending on how open people are to knowing stuff, but to, to be accurate and to be able to explain the underlying phenomena. Um, so we're kind of in that territory right now. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, sorry to be late. No worries. Um, Rick, go ahead. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, just to build on what Klaus was just uh, talking about, I think there's different dimensions, and I, I like to take a step back from this a little bit, and, and I was thinking of a title. Now, this title may not ring, but it's just a first stab at it, which is a, a meta book on neo books. And the reason why I, I something like that, put it, put aside the language for the time being, but, I, I, you know, we've been having these conversations for time, but each of us are coming in with a slightly different sort of frame of perspective about what we think neo books, books are. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think we need to capture that diversity. And so if, if there's going to be a short book, I would suggest that you actually do a co-authorship of it. 
uh, with a group of people, and we need to include some women too, um, to be part of it. Uh, people who have the aspiration, whether they do or not, to write a neo book um, and run it by it. Because, you know, going back to Klaus's point, if, if when somebody <clears throat> gets too wrapped up in their own head with their own particular worldview, that's where people can go awry because they're not really cross checking it or cross validating it with other people. Um, and I think that's one of the features of, of a neo book. I mean, I see it as a sort of um, an agile, adaptive, co-authoring uh, platform for both process and content of varying degrees. I mean, Klaus, you've said this before, different, different levels that it's written at so that if people want the sort of, you know, the basic level, but if it has the, you know, ability to go deeper, um, where if you have a content expertise and somebody who, who really knows it and you can validate it, then it can go off in a different direction. So, um, how, how, you know, how do you create uh, it as a dynamic co-evolving um, process that doesn't really have a beginning or end? It may have a public, publication date, but that's just the beginning. It should be the beginning, not the end. And how do you then co-opt people into the process of becoming part of that learning community? And I'll just give you an experience. I just came from another group where there were lots of things being presented, too much in short period of time. And I, I proposed something to, to, uh, to talk about, and I had a small breakout group in it. And what was fascinating, everybody was attracted to this theme. And I said, you know, we need to have these thematic conversations over time. Just having these random small groups, you know, here and there, it's like brownie in motion. It's not, there isn't any iterative process. And I said to them, why don't we try and create, a, you know, using the metaphor of a tapestry and a thread, how can we create threads of conversations that are woven together that provide some sort of coherence in dealing with the complexities of wicked problems? So, um, you know, to me, the, the, the new book idea is just a platform for creating these, we'll call them mycelium networks, tapestries, whatever it is. Because I said, you know, um, you know I lampoon Margaret Mead's speech, uh, you know, quote about, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a small group of people who've always changed the world. I think that's bunk. It's absolute bunk. And we, we have to get rid of that because what we need actually is thousands of small little groups evolving over time and we're not designing learning systems for that function so um i'm glad you're recording this and i'll be curious to know what comes out of it cool thank you um i like what you said rick about the pub the publishing might just be the start of the conversation uh, but good to go back to what Stuart was saying am i cheating by collaborating with others in composing it could be that publication date is just a milestone and a snapshot of the work at that instant but, but that the community has already been building because at pub date, I hope that you're not now seeking, you know, readers or, or participants. Uh, at pub date, I would hope that you have a community going. Yeah, exactly. And so, for example, I mean, as a sort of, um, you know, we, we have to practice what we preach. Mm -hmm. So can we actually do this on a, uh, on a meta book on neo books or a neo book on a neo book or whatever you call it? Because we have to be able to demonstrate that we're capable of doing those things for ourselves before we can go out and say how they should be used. And each of us are going to have differences. I mean, I, what I really like about Klaus's work is, you know, it's, it's clear, it's content oriented, you know, it builds on things. And that's great. Having said that, I'm more into the process aspects of things. Uh, and we need to think about different metaphors that we use for content and process things. I'll, I'll share the blog post that I actually uh, use for the, for the trigger of, of this um, this small group. And it was basically asking people to think about ways in which we can use human and AI intelligence synergistically for good and for service of all. Um, and, it you know, we, the conversation was just scratching the surface. And I didn't say anything. I says, why did you come? What triggered you to come? And we just had having, started having a chat. I says, do you want to carry on this conversation? Yes, they wanted to carry on the conversation. Um, but it's, it's, it's you know, it, we live in such an incoherent, atomized, fragmented world that we don't create this, the ways. And, and there's lots of things going on. I think, you know, we're in a sort of such a, 
you know, early stage of an in, sort of exponential curve that we haven't, we're not designing things to really scale things up in a way that uh, could lead to amplified or even better stale exponential impact. So that's my two cents. Thank you. And Dave, thanks for the the t-shirt annotation of uh, Margaret Mead's quote. Rick, you should follow the link that uh, Dave just put in the chat. Um, um, Stacy, do you want to take a swing at the... Uh... No, Stuart. Actually, actually, Stuart has his, his hand up, but I'll, if I can come to you after. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, I just wanted to say I had this little brain flash. And, you know, all titles, all table of contents are actually uh, marketing documents to draw people in. And so the, the little flash that I had was um, neo books. Okay. And nobody knows what that means in some great sense. Um, so that's, that's, our job to, to be um, marketers, all right? But the, the subtitle that popped up in my mind was Neo Books, um, a place for people who want to contribute to a new world or, or something, like, something like that, okay? Um, something, something like that. Mm -hmm. come, 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 come contribute to Neo Books. Mm -hmm. Um, a place for people, you know, who want to contribute to um, remaking the world. Something, something like that. I like the flavor of what you're saying a lot. Good. I, I didn't intend to, it to be, you know, a wordsmith piece, but just that that the overall gestalt of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, Dave, Rick, you're smiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh no, I resonated with it. I was also thinking about what. What you're really talking about is the attractor. What's going to, and yeah. I think framing the attractor is critically important. I think, I, I think, I like the idea, but I think it needs to be developed. So the sentiment, I think, is perfect. Great. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and maybe that was kind of what I was thinking too. That there, I feel like we've had conversations in the past around, uh, like with Ken. I know I've, I've had a little bit with this with Ken, but the then what's the um, the point of discussion, right? And I feel like there's a philosophy of folks who think that discussion is kind of good in and of itself. And for me, it's like, I don't care about discussion for itself. It's got to have a purpose. Like what, you know, what are we discussing for? And I think the Neo books concept may have a little bit of that issue. It's like, there's a notion that Neo books is good because it organizes information and information is good. Um, and I'm not totally convinced on that. I feel like information I mean, it's for a purpose then. And so then it's like, well, what's the purpose? You tell me what the purpose is and then I'll talk to you about what Neo books are. And so, um, and so one of the things I've ex gotten excited, I keep coming back to these meetings probably because I, I, I like the idea of the nuggets being embers. The purpose of an ember is to inspire somebody's, uh, <laughs> thinking. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of got a learning component, but it's not to teach them anything. It's just to inspire the process of thinking. Right. So it's kind of provoke, I guess, is the kind of a notion. So, so like, I feel like I can come up with a purpose for the Neo Buck framework that um you know I, i'm pleased with and so that's great but and i can imagine you know like wikipedia kind of i think is to organize information in some sense you know the use of wikipedia turns out you know, there's lots of uses but i'm not sure that the producers the producers like to organize information you know um and so i, I think you could have you know a variety of forms of kind of motivation around it's it is about to to teach somebody to do something it's to get them to do something it's to, you know, entertain them, um, you know, it's to give them a community, right? I mean, you could have a whole set of kind of purposes, I think, implicit in the Neobucks conversation. One of the things I think is in inherent is the, um, is the collaboration component. So you, it does keep coming back to somehow or another, Neobooks allow multiple people to engage in the content in a way that builds new content. I mean, that seems to be kind of uh, prima facie, but, um, but it still kind of leaves open the why. Why are they engaging peace? And Which is a, Thomas, you had said something at the end of the last call around, you know, your, the, your book is great because you, you've you been able to reuse pieces of it, which I think is fantastic. But for you, the, the test of the Neo book in my mind 
would be, will other people reuse the content? But I didn't, I didn't okay. say it's great. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I'm, that's kind of, I feel like there's a design problem, you know, like, yeah, I can take stuff I've done and I re can reuse it because I've internalized it. But the Neobook's challenge is going to be putting something out into the world and somebody else uses it, right? And so this is yeah. gets back to the reciprocity kinds of issues. What what's the what's their capacity? How hard is it to understand? How motivated are they? You know those kinds of questions. Yeah, but but that's exactly what what uh, um, what I've been doing. So for example, um, I uh, part of these nuggets when I post them, I have hundreds of of people uh, uh, engaging with it mm -hmm. and. Yeah. You have conversations centering around it, um, and they're, they're high level enough. I mean, for example, uh, you know, I've engaged with the Bionutrient Food Association to point out the, to them that carbon intensity scores may have relevancy for them, you know, with their nutrient density scores. So I wrote an article on that, and that article resonated widely, right? It's a discussion point. So now there are follow up meetings coming out of this. And so they're, they're, yeah, I think it's. I think your work has been hugely valuable, but it's it's more on the lines of a book. You are a thought leader. You have developed these these ideas. You own these ideas, and you're able to promulgate them, explain them, present them to people. You know, you own them, and I think that's that's fantastic. And I feel like it's, it's not kind of what a neo book is about, right? Because I mean, a neo book is supposed to be some other kind of thing where other people are engaged. Um, and you don't need other people. You're able to do it on your own, right? Which is cool. Do it that you know. Do it that way. Well, I use I use uh, AI, you know, as an enhancement, um, and it just it just works. But I agree that you should have at some point in time you need a team of people you know, to look at this in more depth and and uh, um, and, and broaden the overall perspective. Yeah. Uh, just a traditional book would have editors and commenters and you would have early readers and stuff. You know, I mean, that's that's a good process. You end up with a better book. Right. But the, those readers and all that don't become a part of the community later on in some sense. They're just no, like they're no. just part of the process of creating a book. Um, and Dave, when you said you own that material, I assume you mean like you have mastery over that material, not that you have any intellectual rights over it, because. Klaus did not invent the small water cycle, for example. He did not invent soil fertility or these other metrics. He's pointing to other people's work, but his integration of it and ability to explain it is, is his own. Is that All right? Track? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's he owns it to the extent that you own stuff you put in a book, too. I mean, kind of from a legal standpoint. I mean, he has copyright over whatever words he used and things like that. But 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 yeah, the ownership in this case was really was you're the one who can you can reuse it because you conceptualized it right and that that kind of ownership i think is critical whereas something like what i've imagined a nugget about is that somehow jerry is able to present a concept that i am able to interpret and reuse and that i think is you know that implies some kind of absorption learning process that i've experienced right that um i i think it's really hard just you know i don't think so i'm interested in seeing the nuggets that Klaus's work decomposes into, because some of those, at least metaphorically, maybe also practically, might be useful in books that I want to write. And then including them by reference, basically, reusing one of Klaus's nuggets would, in fact, be completely possible, even if Klaus's original intention was to say, here's what I've been seeing and thinking. Here you go. So I think, yeah. Um, Rick. Actually, I was going to let Stacy go before. Thank me. you. I was going to go to Stacy after you, but uh, <laughs> no, no, so I, years if you I want. Can, I can, I can wait. So it, it's really hard to answer this because I think it depends on like what can. So I'm more about the process, but I think that there's a lot of goals here, and if I can't know which goal I'm speaking to at the time, then I don't know if it's working. Like I think that. What I'm hearing is that for some people, the goal is to help them write their book. For other people, the goal is to get communities together so that maybe more real world projects will come out of it. 
Um, Dave, I don't think you were on the call yet when Klaus was giving the example of him working with someone and he was talking about how the book needs to be really generic. And you said, so the purpose of conversations are to weed those things out because sometimes people agree on something, but they agree on it for different reasons. And those things get lumped in together. And it's only in conversations that you realize, yes, we should do this, but not for the reason we're all thinking. So like, for example, people might not like how Biden is reacting to the Middle East, but for totally different reasons. So now you get all those people that disagree with how he's reacting and you think they're all on the same page, but they're actually not. And it becomes impossible to move forward. So just as an example on the society 2040, uh, 2045, 2025, 2045 call, Jose had used AI to um, come up with the key insights that came out of the interviews that had all been done. And one of the people on the call had a real problem using AI. And I had asked him if he could ask AI to break it down to a fifth grade level. And after the call, I took 10 minutes and I put my notes in of all the places where those gaps could be. And I sent it to Michael and he totally agreed. There were so many things that if you really simplify it, you see not everybody would would be thinking of it the same way. And on that one document, I could see where people would want to have conversations just to say what their viewpoints are. Even on this call, we might, I mean, one of them was like, should society be fair? Like, what does that mean? You know, simple things like that. But in the course of discussion, I, de you know, it, I, I don't have the right words. But again, for me, neo books, my interest is the process. And because I'm less interested in the actual product of a book, I'm more concerned in when and how the weaving of discussions and groups and real world how that gets designed into it. Thank you. Love that. Thank you. Um, and I'm with you entirely. I'm 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 very interested in the process. And and kind of Dave to answer your question in part. Um, there's a bunch of things about neo. Once you start thinking like a neo book, then you realize, oh, this is really a way of hopefully improving debate and getting people to change party platforms, getting people to change corporate strategies. Uh, then there's another angle on it, which is some nuggets are instrumentable, which is the wrong word, but you can turn them into code that could actually be useful in the world. So in some sense, the nuggetization of ideas is a way of trying to release them into the world so that they might cause more change than they do when they're trapped in books. And I'm, I'm, I'm making this assertion that information is sort of trapped in books and PDFs. It doesn't have the freedom of movement and the engagement uh, of community and, and debate that it that normally they need to have. Uh, go ahead, Rick, then Klaus. Yeah, just to um, to build on something Dave was talking about, I mean, it comes back to the telos, the purpose, the why. And if you can really focus on the why, the why is, the, is you know, is the thing that inspires people, if you can capture that. But uh, what I'm hearing is that people are coming with different angles, and I'm thinking about, um, well, how can you create a sort of flexible definitional framework where you may have a typology of different types of books? So some of them may be a little bit old school dish, you know, uh, you know, the, a more traditional book. Others at the other extreme would be entirely focusing on process, thinking about the meta level. So if you think about an ecological framework of learning, you know, you could think about different perspectives that people can bring to the table. So the question is, how do you define it broadly enough that's inclusive uh, for people coming in and say, you know, I think I can fit into this framework and I'd, be, I'd like to be part of this learning community. So I think one needs to think about the fact of element or the writer development of the, you know, the, the, the people who are going to be involved in developing these things. And then thinking about, well, how can that over time actually cascade to involve other people because they, they see it such so attractive. I mean, 
you know, David, I mean, the work you're doing in GRC, I mean, I think it's evolving in that sort of direction, but I, you know, you know, there's little subgroups, but the subgroups from my perspective and participation aren't that well connected. Um, and so, you know, well, how do you then have cross fertilization within an organization to do it? So I think there's, there's far more questions than answers here, but if we can ask better questions, and that could be part of the purpose of the, of the uh, you know, the NEA book is, how do we ask even better questions to be able to, um, and I'll just put something in here, which is just playing off what Stuart was saying. Maybe I already put it in, maybe I did, but it was just a different, uh, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, I I'll, I'll hear, you know, this This is, uh, you know, co-create a fair, free, free, flourishing future on a healthy planet. Are people attracted to that frame? I have no idea. You have to go out and test it in the market and say, neobooks, metatag, and then test it. See which one people are drawn to the most because, you know, Klaus has got skills in marketing and I'm sure we can put them to good use. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Uh, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I wanted to come back to what Stacy was just saying. Um, <clears throat> the the uh, when, when, we, when we raise an issue, um, uh, and let me come back to to my uh, Jonathan Foley example of uh, hamburgers and and alpha alpha coin here. If if Jonathan had raised the issue that thirty percent of water being used in Arizona is going to core alpha alpha uh, for cattle feed, that would have been great. But then he added that you should stop eating hamburgers, and that was just throwing the whole thing off, right? So, so for so if you if you uh, uh, take uh, no, I mean right now there's a raging debate uh, about the uh, increase in minimum wage for California's fast food workers, and somebody posted uh, created a post on this, and it elicited uh, some really great conversations because it shows how how uninformed you know, the average citizen really is about how government works. And if you pay people less than a living wage, then they need food stamps, then they need, you know, or they need social services or support structures. Who's going to pay for that? Where does that money come from? So so I think if meta if our if the meta book concept is to raise complex issues and open them up for debate in a way that you don't preempt someone or you don't create uh, uh, a quasi solution that then everybody wants to disagree with, right? So then they're focusing on the solution you're proposing instead of the underlying problem you know, that you're highlighting here. So I think, you know, so in that sense, so I've been really careful in offering solutions uh, uh, that um, that just leads to, to unnecessary debates, but simply clarify uh, the issues. Uh, um, and Klaus, in a in a better world than we have, the solutions that you're proposing would become attractors for policy people who are like, oh, oh, this is a nice way to articulate the policy we've been trying to figure out. Let's adopt it. And then for journalists to come in and say, oh, we're trying to write about this thing. Let's point to this body of work that Klaus has created and so forth. And my, my hope is that some better clarity of argument shows up and some connectedness between a policy proposal and the science, you know, on them being done on the ground and the people trapped in between all of that, people like farmers, uh, so that they could collaborate to make better decisions. That's that, that's that's the ambitious goal of, of, uh, of deconstructing knowledge into nuggets and making them more alive. Uh, Stuart. Yeah, so um, my my burning question at this point in time is, um, and in some ways I'm I'm back to something that I I I I, I articulated I don't know two three meetings ago, um, and that is we don't know what we have on, until it emerges. <laughs> we don't know. Okay, we don't know how people are going to respond to any platform that we put out until it starts to emerge and people starts to play with it. 
So my question is, you know, and Jerry, you're the orchestra leader here. Um, what's your sense of, of, of a timeline and what needs to be done before we say to the world, hey, we got a platform. Uh, we're looking for content experts who want to start uh, um, um, and contribute their Neo book to our platform. Um, so what's your what's your sense of that one? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm uh, working with Pete to create a proposal to use the last of funds that I received and, and put in Lions Care, Lionsburg's Care. Right. Um, in order to fund a couple of improvements to uh, Massive Wiki, which okay. would allow for some of those conversational things to be more obvious around nuggets, the way I'm writing them in Markdown, putting them on GitHub. Uh, that That's a little bit complicated way to say there's a couple features that will allow nuggets to be more conversational that won't show up in their full all singing, all dancing version, but should be good enough for the demo you're talking about. Then I'm trying to create this presentation that both explains like what nuggets are and how and how this world works, but also points to them and says, hey, here, here's a nugget. Let's start with this. I'm starting with the nugget, assume good intent or assume good faith. Right. And uh, because that that's reusable in lots of different contexts, it's a really interesting place. It's a foundational piece of my own thinking and design from trust. Awesome. Uh, so we can sort of point to it as a reusable nugget of, of an idea. Um, and when I get my explanation recorded and Pete has those pieces in place, I think is a really good time to go back into the broader community and say, hey, here's a, a description of what this thing tastes and smells like, and here's a working example that you could come play with. Okay, follow on question. Um, so I have, you know, plus or minus 140 pages of a Neo book that raises a lot of um, interesting questions, right? As a practical matter, how do I engage with what you're thinking? Because what I just heard was that I need to turn that into nuggets in some ways um, for people to engage with, as opposed to people engaging um, with a broader book, or is that something that um, will be some function of some, some software algorithm or AI process that'll take the book and turn it into nuggets? And I think I've heard something about that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm actually composing in nuggets. Uh, most all most of the rest of you who are writing a manuscript uh, that that we're sort of trying to work with are writing in Google Docs, let's say. And then we need then we have the question of how do we chunk this up? Right. Um, it is not a terrible idea to use AI to break it into nuggets. AI is very good at, at understanding context shifts and all that. And AI might even be good at generating the the broken up files that we want to call nuggets. So. Could we could this could be a very nice application of AI. It's like, hey, take this document and break it into nuggets by this definition of what a nugget might be, and then we see what happens. Um, other than that, it's a bit of a manual labor task uh, to sit down and say, well, here's an idea, here's an elaboration of the idea, here are some examples of the idea. And for me, you know, assume good intent is an idea. Um, a case study of, hey, the internet works this way and here's how. Hey, Wikipedia works this way and here's how. Each of those is its own nugget explaining this other nugget about the idea. So each of these, it's not that the nugget has to include all of the explanations and all of the case studies. It's that each of these nuggets can wrap up into a bigger story told by, by traversing several different nuggets, for example. So it's I think it's easy to see the deconstruction of a longer narrative work into these nuggets, these component parts. So uh, another follow-up question. Um, so you've explained a couple of things that need to be done that you're working on. Do you have any sense of timeline for these? Um, if we want to just throw this into the maw of ChatGPT and see what happens, we don't need to wait that long uh, okay. because anybody with the time to go do that and the patience to, to refine it, because usually you have to do it several times, you have to figure out what your prompts are. Sure. Anybody, anybody who wants to try that, like awesome. And Pete and I could help with the technical part of it of, oh, here's a bunch of subfiles. Here's what we do with those subfiles now, right? And where we put them. Um, so that's that doesn't need to wait for much of anything. That experiment is easy to do for anybody who's willing to try it. Great. The manual labor part of it depends on all of our time, which is complicated because we're all doing 
too many different disconnected things, but there we go. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Rick, then Stacy. Yes, Stuart, I just want to pick up on something you said about content, um, and it, it feeds into something that Stacy was talking about when I was talking about earlier about the process. There's, there is this tension between content and process. You can have all the best content in the world, but if you don't have the right process, you're not going to be able to do anything with your content. So the question then becomes uh, how, you know, I, I, I'm still, you know, um, not, I, I don't lock myself into one metaphor. So when I keep on hearing nuggets, it's sort of, uh, to me, a nugget is something that's somewhat static. It's sort of solid, um, whereas it's not organic emergent or, you know, as David said, his ambers where he wants to ignite things. So I think we need to have a, and I put this into that blog post that I shared with you, and I, I might use the amber metaphor, uh, David, if you don't mind. I was just playing around with the metaphor. I have some reservations about it because of the cons, you know, the, you know, ambers and forest fires and the associations that you might have with it. But I do like the idea of different metaphors. They all have upsides and downsides. So my my caution is not getting too locked into. Um, from my perspective, a nugget as a content. And I'm much more, to me, the, the content is about what. What do you need to know, right? Whereas process is more, as you all know, is about, well, how the hell do we do it? And then the other is, why the hell are we doing it? Which is the purpose. I mean, that's just Simon Simic's golden circle. Um, so how can, how can we touch on those different domains in ways that you actually create some synergy across those domains anyway? Hand it um, over to Stacy. Well, let me let me reply just for a moment before I pass to Stacy. Uh, so I see nuggets as very alive and very emergent and very everything that you wish they were. And I think maybe you're seeing nuggets as a shiny gold nugget, which is maybe the easiest metaphor to go for. Um, would it help if you thought of nuggets as like little uh, feed bombs of extremely fertile soil? Or something like that, where oh no no, they, no. They... you you could, yeah I think no I think it's important to define it you know I everyone's going to you know in marketing you say a word people have a, a panoply of associations from negative positive and then you have to say which is my target market resonating with the positive ones I <laughs> I don't where you know I think you have to define it um, but you know some people are more concrete and you know about it and they'll see it that way so you really have to come up with the definition. But if, if, if the definition is so far removed from what people associate a nugget to be, then I think you need to have different frames. So I'm not, I'm not wedded to one frame, let's put it that way. And a couple of calls back, I think we sort of said, hey, we've had these debates about terminology several times, and I hate getting stuck in those sinkholes, and I'd rather go with words right now and stick with them for a while and then be flexible to change them later when a better word shows up that explains the thing better or that has more popularity and more more catch with people. So I'd rather not yeah. get stuck in that conversation. Well, I, 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 I'm, I, well I, I understand that we had that before, but it's yes and, and you're, pre you're presenting one frame. And so I'm saying yes, and, and, and. So if you can come up with your definition of nuggets that has yes, and, 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 show us your definition. I Good. haven't seen one and, yet. And that's sure. what I'm working on. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. I, I do have some pages that, that, that have some of this. I'll put links in the chat. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, so using the, using the, meta, using the metaphor um, of regeneration, Klaus, you're going to like this, okay? <laughs> and I, and I, think, I think, Rick, you, just, you were just talking about nuggets of soil in some way or nuggets of and and or living nuggets and to me in some ways yeah <laughs> <laughs> not me <laughs> in some ways in some ways we're talking about um regenerative books okay or regenerative bodies of content um you know it's kind of mm -hmm. this new way of of looking at at, at creating living bodies of content um out of these seeds or nuggets or you know whatever we want to call them I, I, that's what i'm Good. hearing mm -hmm. uh, stacy you fell out of the queue i think by accident would you like to go before class yeah real quick i i'm not even going to give a complete thought i'm just going to say that i would resist using ai to pull out the nuggets because i think for a certain segment of people panning for nuggets could be an attractor um, so that's entirely to... true. We could try to crowdsource nuggetization. That would be good too. But then somebody, somebody who's familiar with the work, needs to sort 
sort of oversee that and be part of it. Absolutely. Um, so, so whoever owns the manuscript or created the original manuscript needs to be happy with whatever the process is and be involved. Or both, just to real quick, or both, like I said, on the other call, I took AI and then I critiqued what the AI did, which was fun. I mean, I, I did it because it was fun. I didn't do it for any other reason. Yep. Agreed. Um, thanks. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I just put in an example of how I'm using Nuggets. I'm actually advancing the, uh, the Neo book right now by writing nuggets and then putting them back into the book because it's just sort of a um uh it's an evolution of thought you know that uh, where uh every week or so I, I you know what is the most uh common conversation currently taking place then i write something on it but i write it in as a freestanding nugget and then integrate it into the book does that make sense so so the nugget is a completely like in this case here. It's about uh, biofuels, uh, biofuel feedstocks. You know what are you using for biofuel feedstocks? And by the way, soy and corn are about the worst things, the most inefficient things you could use as a biofuel feedstock. And then so there is the, the AI generated an outline on what you could be using that doesn't compete with the food supply that uses marginal land. Uh, you know, that doesn't take a, a precious farmland for that purpose. Um, and so that that I got a lot of uh, uh, resonance out of out of this article. But then from there, it goes into the book, if that if that makes sense. So so it's it's sort of weird now because uh, uh, you can't I mean, I'm not really thinking about writing a book. I'm, I'm thinking about stringing topics together that are linked uh under the part umbrella of food and agriculture as a system um and plus your the biofuel fuels uh, biofuel feedstocks which is really hard to say three times fast um that <laughs> nugget is quite short it's a, a page with some references and the the second half of it is basically mm. bullet points of different different uh biofuel uh, grasses or plants that could be used which is great it's very nugget the other one that you're using um, is much longer and is probably like a collection of nuggets along the way. That's the book. Easy. That's volume two. Okay, good. So it's it's just a chapter in volume two, yeah. and it's it's fairly generic. It doesn't tell you how you should do it. You know, it doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, get into uh, into any specificity on the implications. Uh, uh, you know, for on logistics and storage and processing centers and all of that. It simply says corn and soy are not good, uh, are competing with the food supply, and it can't go on because you know, we'll, have, we'll end up uh, not being able to feed people as the population continues to grow. So we have to exit and change. So, so, but that could become a book in itself, right? It, this could be the entrance of an entire book because when you get into the complexities of actually doing this, you know, then you're dealing with uh, having to build uh, processing plants uh, that do oil seeds instead of corn. Yeah. Um, agreed. And I think there probably are some books out there, or at least there are some good essays out there that you could find. They might be in the in the resources you said at the end. That right. are already making making this argument that hey biofuels of this particular type are a distraction and a waste of resources or whatever. Yep. I Perhaps just I like that class used the word entrance because that's how I when I think of neo books I think of nuggets as being like doors to like different places. We could call them wormholes. <laughs> well, never mind, that sounds terrible. Yeah. Since we're watching the three body problem, yes. Yeah. Apparently, the uh, beginning of the three body problem is not very popular in China because they really don't like anything that says, hey, during the Cultural Revolution, we did some very shitty things. Yeah. You should check out some of our uh, early stuff about slavery. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the Nazis used um, 
Jim Crow laws as examples and motivators for what to do to Jews in Germany. They were actually working off our blueprints. Clark, Clark Gable. And, yeah. mm -hmm. I did, I've been going back, Jerry, I don't know if this, I don't want to take you too far off track, but I went back and looked at the, uh, that old internet design paper from uh, and there, the, the oh notion my God. Of, of designing for participation seems like, yeah. and I wonder actually, maybe if nuggets need a little more, you know, you, there's, there's granularity and specificity kind of the, you, and, you know, like in software, we've got, you know, several layers of structure that allow things to be reusable. And, and maybe that maybe the nuggets actually could use a little more structure well, they likely they likely will need to obey some standards and protocols and other sorts of things in order to be very reusable. So I completely agree. Like I don't like what's a nugget stack look like or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And a piece of the conversation that's too geeky for these calls, but that Pete and I have engaged in some is uh, what metadata should accompany a good nugget, and where do you put it, and how do you make it so that it's easy to add but not visible, so that it interrupts the narrative, right? And how do you make it so that the metadata hides, but is available technologically, but it hides when you compile up the book, when you roll all the nuggets up into a thing that should read as a straight, continuous uh, batch of prose. And that we those are unsolved things so far. And I'm, I'm willing to bet a few people out there have solved different pieces of those puzzles. So I think I, I don't think we're in huge trouble, but I think that that's the stuff that needs to be solved along the way as well. I, I mean, in some sense, you're trying for footnotes version two right bingo yes and and hyperlinks hypertexts footnotes references uh inline call outs uh annotations there's a whole bunch of words and ways we've kind of done this each of which serves a different kind of purpose there's also things like hypothesis which can attach itself to most any web page and create a, a separate discussion that informs the web page right that's there um and one of the experiments that I, that Pete is hopefully going to do is to connect Discourse, which is a full-fledged forum software, to a nugget so that the, the first post in a Discourse thread could become the nugget and then the conversation. And Discourse is a fully-fledged uh, threaded discussion forum. It's really it's nicely done. It has you know user authentication and IDs and all that kind of stuff. So that would be a great place for a conversation about a nugget, as opposed to somebody trying to offer changes to the nugget itself, which is a different task related. So a piece of what we're trying to solve is how do these things actually function and, and to not make them too, too geeky and too technical. And I'm not noticing the sky darkening at all. So we're too, we're way too far off the uh, path of occlusion. Stacy, I, I wanna know what time you're gonna get dark. It's gonna be cool. Well, I'm, I'm stepping out episodically, and it's about a third at the moment. And ah. it's getting significantly darker here. But it's probably only 75 80% in Charlotte, North Carolina. But we're not at its peak yet. I've just been popping it out with my glasses just to get a That's peek at what's going on. That's hey, terrific. Guys. Yeah. I can't that see, I can't see a damn thing. <laughs> Love that. Maybe we should have an eclipse metaphor. <laughs> Would be good. I know. Um, 325 will be maximum here. 325. All right. So another hour. Uh, noon 25 my time, which is another hour. That's great. Oh, that's pretty soon. It's closing in on you. Are you sure you're going to be okay? <laughs> um, any other thoughts for this conversation on this call. Um, if not, we can wrap a little early and let everybody enjoy the the eclipse to whatever extent it comes hey, to I'm just curious, what, what, what do you anticipate your, uh, you know, it sounds like you're gonna write a, a book on Neo books and what sort of timeline are you envisioning for that? Do you have, have you got something lined, you know, have you thought that far ahead yet or not? Oh, I know it's a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the my first priority is this presentation explaining neo books, which will hopefully be um, uh, a Google Slides deck that maps to Wiki uh, pages in Massive Wiki with a video that explains it. And the thing that I'll 
show people is the video. I'll, you know, I'll bring that back here. Then I'm actually writing a book about design from trust, which is a very substantive piece of work that I need to write a book about. So that's the main, that's the first book I'm trying to write. Along the way, I'm trying to seed the writing of the book about neobooks. Uh, because okay. in fact, that would prove the point of what neobooks are good at in that several of the nuggets that are in the first book are probably reusable in the neobooks uh, book as well. Um, so I, that's, if, you know, that's a ways away. I don't know exactly. It's, it's certainly not in the next couple of months that I can achieve all of that. That's um, fine. That's okay. Yeah, but but that's kind of the path that I'm putting myself on. So I I just had a um, a metaphor for the eclipse. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> the world will take us into darkness. Neo books will take us into light. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> At least we don't have a three broadie problem to contend with. <laughs> well, it, uh, I'll tell you what happened to me on Sunday spontaneously. I was out, I was on a Zoom call and I was jogging and running and walking, whatever. And the sun was behind me. It was unbelievable. And so what I did, I said, let me give you an, ex an eclipse experience a day early. I, I had the sunlight over me and I moved my head in the way. It went dark and then went over this way. And I said, did you appreciate that eclipse? I thought it was quite an opportunity of serendipity to come a day early with it so Im impromptu eclipse i like it it, it was imp improvisation improvisation we need lots of improvisation that's true we, we really do so many things are broken i'm just reading far too many essays about the political situation and how screwed up democrats and progressives are that they can't explain their way out of a paper bag it's bad <laughs> scary it's very scary. Yep. That's where we need David's embers to burn the bag, right? <laughs> Something like it's that. It's actually incomprehensible how in the 21st century, a modern society like ours, you know, you have a bunch of rich guys go out there and just flagrantly violate every basic uh, ethos, right? I mean, in supporting this guy, it's just, uh, it just blows you away. Yep. Well, actually, that, that that's that's a good point. You might you might want to think about how you can. I mean, to me, it comes back to ethics, virtues, whatever. And how can you positively reframe that in a way that highlights ethics and virtues? Because we're in a downward spiral into the immoral abyss, and nothing looks like it's reversing upwards yet. So. Oh, but 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 it's you know we have had previous discussions about. Uh, moving into a better world and more enlightened world and all of those things. And and, and uh, I even listened to Elon Musk the other day saying, uh, you look into the future and everything is the same conflict that it was in the past, no matter how far back you go, right? So you have Star Wars <laughs> going, going forward, but it seems mm -hmm. to be innately embedded into our nature, right? That we... Uh, you know that we are always at the precipice of uh, morality versus uh, uh, greed. You know, and and uh, uh, and but it hasn't been as blatant as it is right now in a long time. It comes back to Stuart's comment about the light and the dark, the eternal buffer, right? I keep thinking that you know. Um... People are not going to change behavior until um, there are massive amounts of pain, and we haven't experienced enough yet. Mm -hmm. Which is a horrible thought, yeah. Uh, because, because for the first time in our evolution, that kind of pain could be final, could be could be uh, lethal. Could be. Could be. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, then, I don't sleep so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I spent yeah. six hours yesterday binge watching Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman new uh, Netflix series. <laughs> I've been watching that one. <laughs> I have one more episode to watch. Is it good? Well, I enjoyed it, but I, I, you know, what, what I enjoy these action with some level of violence programs. It just, that's the only thing that 
grabs my attention. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is what civilization has come to. Yeah. Did, did you watch? Did you watch the movie, Stuart? The Matthew McConaughey. No. And sure. uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's his name? The uh, uh, Matthew McConaughey and the the Brit guy, the Love Actually guy, uh, Hugh Grant. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So I should watch the movie too, huh? I, I you know, same in same caliber anyway. Yeah. Great. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. So I have Are something to look forward to now. When I'm done, I'll watch the last episode of his series. <laughs> it's called The Gentleman thing? Yeah. The Gentleman. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I the, actually watched know. a Guy Ritchie movie yesterday, too, and I was thinking, he really puts out good movies. Like, I only knew his name from years ago when Madonna dated him. But they were he married for many movies. years. They were, they were actually married for many years. Were they? I didn't yeah. follow that much. But the point is, he puts out good movies. He does, yeah. It's a little yeah. embarrassing, but he does, yeah. Yeah. Well, when they split I'll, up, I'll I think he was he he was looking for alimony from her or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if you if you watch PBS, I just happened to watch the first episode by mistake last night. It was on. It was the Postman. No, it was Mister Bates against the Post Office or something like that. And it's about the scandal. And I I read about it, but oh, Mister Bates versus the Post Office. Yeah, that's it. And it's all about a computer error that put a huge number of small post offices into debt. And it went on for like a decade. And it's it's only just beginning to unfold. Uh, it's it's just unbelievable. I remember reading about it in, in superficial details and say, oh, yeah. but watching this is if you want to know how computers can go awry, you might you want you might want to watch that. So uh, my understanding of this is that ICL wrote a program called Horizon IT that got installed by the post office, which is the private postal service. It's not the Royal Mail. The Royal Mail still exists and is the public utility sort of postal service for, for England. But there's a private thing called the post office founded, founded in 1987 back in Thatcher days. And they installed this software. And then it turns out that the, the software was faulty and was basically shorting yep. some money. But... They believed the software and didn't believe the subalterns or whatever the the, the, super, mm -hmm. the superintendents who were in the postal offices. So they started accusing and suing those people, exactly. uh, four of whom committed suicide, um, and hundreds of careers were ruined. Uh, and this yeah. went on for twenty years before a couple exposés recently um, turned it out, including the movie that Rich just mentioned. Mm. It's it's unbelievable. It is just unbelievable. Anyway, I, I I'm going to watch it because it's so. Uh, it was captivating about how it started. Anyway, you might want to take a peek. It's in. it's heartbreaking. Um, it's just and it's also about over reliance on technology. It's it's very much about how nobody nobody was really questioning the ICL software when in fact that's where the flaw was. There's a great series that just got uh, came out on PBS. It's called Our Miracle Years. Mm. Um, and it is about Germany starting in 1946, so after the war, and mm. the rebuilding, and the the uh, complexity, you know, of uh, people coming back uh, from uh, being in their roles of an SS uh, Sturmbahnführer and a factory owner who produced, who used uh, slave labor. You know, and all these things, and so how they're reintegrating themselves. It's really interesting. It's really well done. Mm. So interesting. Yeah, it's unser wunderbar Jahr. Our miracle years. Yeah, on PBS. Yeah. There's too much good stuff to watch. You have to be very selective. That's the thing. It's, yeah, not, it's hard to find. You know. Uh, oh no! Yeah. Yeah, but I'm just saying there's so much out there that there's, you know, really good stuff to watch. And mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, enjoy enjoy your eclipses as uh, as you catch them. Thanks for another great call. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. More soon.